I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. Today I'm speaking with Professor Daniel Serwer. He is a professor at the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. Hello, Professor Serwer. Welcome to UATV. Pleasure to be with you. Today I want to discuss with you the current conflict in Ukraine, but I also wanted to talk to you about the situation in the Balkans. To, to begin with, how would you s describe the current state of the conflict in eastern Ukraine? I would describe it as a semi-frozen conflict at this point, one that could certainly get much worse uh, and that could certainly get much better. What is Putin's end game, the Kremlin's end game in this conflict? Is it to take over eastern Ukraine? It's very unclear to me. Uh, I think if he really wanted to take over eastern Ukraine, he has the military capability to do that and might have done it already. When I talk to Russia experts about this, they tell me that what he's really after is to neutralize all of Ukraine, not to take over eastern Ukraine. And the way of doing that is to insist on constitution, a constitution that would make it impossible for the authorities in Kiev to, to make any decisions without uh, Eastern Ukrainian approval, any important decisions like alignment with the European Union and that kind of thing. With regard to the conflict, uh, you say it's a frozen conflict right now. What needs to happen to bring a proper peaceful solution? Well, both sides have to uh, get very tired of it. That is, they have to figure that they can be better off if they go to the negotiating table rather than continue the current fairly low levels of, of conflict. Uh, and they have to agree that there's some way out of the conflict. And uh, I don't think I've seen either thing happen yet. This is this conflict falls in the category of those that are well enough managed that they are very hard to bring to a conclusion. Uh, and I don't see much willingness either in Kiev or in Moscow to compromise. I know you worked in the Dayton Peace Accords. With regard to the Minsk agreements, what are some of the weaknesses and strengths of that agreement? Well, uh, you know, it seems to me that uh, the, the strengths are that it would bring the violence to an end. Uh, the weaknesses are that it would, uh, as I best understand it, weaken the central government in Ukraine significantly. And that can create the kind of dysfunctional government that you have in Bosnia. How effective have the sanctions been against Russia? We've heard differing opinions that the sanctions have been very effective, and I've also heard that it, they haven't been effective really at all. It's very hard to judge because at the same time as you get the sanctions, more or less the same time you get the, uh, the lowering of oil prices, and that probably has had a bigger impact on Russia than the, uh, than the sanctions per se. It's another thing I think important to understand about sanctions. You don't get what you want from sanctions when you impose the sanctions. You get what you want from sanctions when you start to engage in a negotiation over lifting the sanctions. That's certainly what happened in the Balkans, and I suspect it's what will happen as well in uh, Ukraine. I wanted to ask you, uh, going into the Balkans, what are some of the differences and similarities between the conflict in eastern Ukraine and what happened in the Balkans during the 90s? Well, certainly you have uh, in uh, the Balkans and in the Ukraine uh, countries that were not fully homogenized in their populations. That is, uh, people who continue to think of themselves in the Balkans as Croats, Serbs, and Bosniaks rather than as citizens of the same country. And you have some of that in Ukraine, but not nearly as much. It seems to me that most Ukrainians think of themselves as Ukrainians, even those who, for whom their native language may not be Ukrainian. Uh, 
Uh, but you do have a less hom homogeneous population than you have in many parts of, uh, of Western Europe. You've also got a situation in Ukraine where there are very strong forces externally that are pulling things apart. You've got Europe in the West, you've got Russia in the East, and in Bosnia, for example, you had Serbia in the East and Croatia in the West. And, and those external forces, uh, when, um, when they become malign, and in, certainly in Bosnia under uh, Milosevic, uh, there was malign influence from Serbia and sometimes malign influence also from Tuchman in Croatia. That started to tear Bosnia apart. And I think you, you have, uh, at least in my way of thinking, malign influence uh, on the east in Ukraine. And you have uh, the west uh, pulling against that malign influence, maybe not as strongly as I might like. How much influence does the Kremlin have in the Balkans? The Kremlin right now is increasing its influence in the Balkans significantly because the Americans have been trying to withdraw. Uh, that's been going on for the better part of a decade now. And the European perspective of the Balkans has declined. Uh, the, the Europeans promised uh, a European perspective for all the Balkan countries. They fulfilled that promise with respect to Slovenia and Croatia. But for the others, there are signs that it will, might be a very long time before they become European Union members. And that reduces the incentive a great deal and opens up the region to, uh, to Russian influence. And the Russians are prepared to take enormous risks. They risked uh, an attempted coup in Montenegro, for example. Uh, and Putin, Putin is a very different Russian leader from Yeltsin. In the 90s, uh, the West faced Yeltsin in the Balkans, and that wasn't too difficult uh, uh, an arm wrestle. But Putin is a much tougher opponent. How worried are you about conflict possibly re-erupting in the Balkans, especially with regard to Serbia and Kosovo and uh, Bosnia? Well, there's certainly some possibility of conflict re-erupting. It wouldn't be the same conflict that we saw uh, more than 20 years ago. Nobody has the armies uh, to fight for three, three and a half years. Nobody has the malign leadership to do that. Uh, but you could certainly see instability maybe promoted by non-state actors, militias acting on behalf of a uh, creed or another. Uh, you have some real possibilities that things come apart in the Balkans and that very much be avoided because we know how devastating it can be. Uh, the president of Serbia, Alexander Vucic, where is he trying to lead his country? <laughs> Excuse me, closer to the west or closer to the east? He says he's trying to lead it closer to the west, but then he tries very hard also to keep on good terms uh, with Moscow. Look, there are countries in Western Europe that like to stay on very good terms with Moscow. And frankly, we have a president in the United States right now who would like to improve relations with Moscow. So that in and of itself is not a problem. It becomes a problem when you start allowing a, a so-called humanitarian base in niche, uh, whether this base is really a humanitarian base or a military logistics base isn't very clear to me. Uh, it could certainly have dual uses. Uh, you know, I, I think Serbia is at risk of drifting towards the east, even under a president who says he wants to take it to the west, partly because the western pole of attraction, the European Union, seems much weaker right now than it has been in the past. And my very final question, what is your prognosis? How do you think the region, the Balkans, will end up in the next 10, 20 years? Oh, I'm 
pretty confident in 20 years that all of the Balkans will be members of the EU. And I think I'd be confident even in saying that all of the Balkans, except for Serbia, will be a member of uh, NATO. And even with respect to Serbia, it's their choice. It's NATO's choice. So I have long-term hope for the Balkans, despite the current situation. Look, there's been a very long uh, recession in in uh, Western Europe, and that recession has an impact both on the economies of the Balkans, on the, on the mood in the Balkans, but also on the mood in, in Western Europe. And as the European economy recovers, I think we'll see some improvements. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Saru. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm Alex Gupta with UATV. I was speaking with Professor Daniel Serwer. He is a professor at the School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C.